Hello. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Let's quickly recap what we talked about in week two of dynamics. We had talked about a single particle moving through space. So this is my particle over here of mass m. Then we had discussed two things. The first one was the kinematics, meaning the description of the motion of the particle. Let's call this here the kinematics. And then, of course, as we know from mechanics one and from everywhere else, there are forces acting on the particle. You know, these can be forces from the ground, some reaction forces. There can be some external forces. There can be some friction forces. There can be all kinds of things that these forces are acting onto the particle. And we want to link the forces acting onto the particle with the motion. So we link the forces with the kinematics. That's exactly what we call the kinetics. Linking motion to those forces and potentially torques that cause the motion. And what we had seen is that there are three fundamental principles that we can use in order to find out how those are related. The first one is what we call LMB, or linear momentum balance. And this is nothing else but Newton's famous F equals ma. We had written this a bit differently. We had said that the sum of all forces acting onto the particle equals the time derivative of its linear momentum vector, which is just mass times velocity. This here was our p vector. And of course, in our case, if m is constant, that what we assume most of the time, right? So if the mass of the particle doesn't change, then this simply becomes the sum of all forces equals not zero, like in statics anymore, but mass times acceleration, where a is the acceleration of the particle. And so what this means is nothing else but if you take a particle and if it is being exposed to a force, so let's say that you apply a certain force F down here, that this force will result in an acceleration. And this acceleration will be pointing in the very same direction. Note that this is a vector equation. So whatever direction your net force is pointing in, that will be the same direction as your acceleration in that moment. So there will be an acceleration A in the same direction. Only the magnitude, of course, cannot be the different. These two have two different units. The proportionality factor is the mass m. So this would be nothing else but the applied force divided by the mass of that particle. And that's what we call linear momentum balance. And this is nothing else but the net force equals not zero anymore, but mass times acceleration, as you have known from you know, mechanics one from statics. The second principle also is something which is nothing else but an extension from statics, and that's angular momentum balance, or AMB as we call it. And here, the most general form, and I hope you can still read this up there, the most general form that we derived here was that the torque of a particle with respect to a point B was given as the velocity of that point B times the linear momentum of that particle, P. And so, of course, here we can also draw a picture. If this over here is my particle, if you can see my particle, and this particle is moving, let's say, for example, on a circular trajectory, you can fix any point B. Let's say if we take this point, we call this B. And then our linear momentum balance is nothing else but the velocity of this point B. This guy, in principle, could be moving, right? So it could have a velocity, VB, cross the linear momentum of my particle. This particle has linear momentum P. And that's nothing else but mass times velocity, as we just introduced. Right? So here, this vector is P equals mass times velocity. And, well, what we need in addition, this equation is not complete, there's the most important thing missing, because there's plus hb dot, which comes in. What is this hb dot? This hb dot is nothing else but the time derivative of the angular momentum of the particle. Let's see what exactly this is. So we would introduce a vector here, r, which goes from b to p. And with this, we can define our hb in the following way. We know that this angular momentum is nothing else but the vector from b to p cross. And here, we take linear momentum of the particle. 
Now, the one thing we notice here is, of course, point B could be moving, but what, whenever we can, we should make a smart choice here. We should either fix this point, in which case VB is zero, or we let it move in parallel with a particle, in which case this cross product here is zero, because these two vectors are parallel. And so we should always choose that this goes to zero, and this is our choice. Right? What we should do is make B either fixed, or let it move in parallel with the particle. In that case, what happens then is that the net torque, this resultierende moment, which is being applied to the particle, is nothing else but hb dot, which is d by dt, of this thing over here. All right. And now, of course, one can do this for all kinds of scenarios. Uh, we can play with this a bit, but the most important case that we discussed in class is the 2D case, where things become a bit simpler. So in 2D, what we essentially have is, let's for fun just fix a certain point B, right? This is my point B. And now let's say that my particle is somewhere over here. This is my particle M. And now what we found in 2D is that this boils down to a very neat and simple relation, namely the moment of torque with respect to point B is nothing else but, and this over here evaluates to something simple, namely a constant, which we call IB, the mass moment of inertia, times phi double dot. And this IB in particular in 2D uh, can be defined. And if we just look at the picture, what we really have here is the following. If I now apply a torque moment with respect to point B, let's call this MB, then this will result in somehow a rotation of the particle. So this will be moving, right? And its angle will change. And what we see here is that the angular acceleration is linked to the torque that is being applied. And this is the relation that we have in the simplest case in 2D. Of course, we should be a little careful. This doesn't always hold in 2D. This only holds if the distance from B to the particle is fixed. So in 2D, if the distance R from B to P is constant. Right? So only the distance, not the distance vector, of course, I could also write it this way. So in other words, if, for example, you have your particle at a stick or rod of fixed length, in that particular case, this is the equation that holds. And in this particular case, the IB, this constant, is nothing else but the mass of the particle times this radius from here to here squared. And that is a very neat relation. How do we interpret this? Well, let's look at the two relations that we have now. Over here is our equation for angular momentum balance, and down here is our equation for linear momentum balance. This over here told us that if I apply a net force, then that one results in an acceleration in the same direction. This one over here tells us if I apply a net torque, this will result in an angular acceleration. So these two are more or less you know, analogous. This deals with linear motion, and this deals with rotational motion. And in both cases, there's a constant. Here it's mass. Here it's the so-called mass moment of inertia. All right, so the last thing we discussed, and that's the last thing I want to write down here, is work energy balance. We call this work energy balance. I don't really have a funny abbreviation for this. WEB is the WAP, so I'm not sure if that's very smart work energy balance. And what we did here is we said, we sometimes want a shortcut. If we know our particle initially is here, in state one, with a certain velocity, and you know, after a while it's up here, and we either want to know where it is, for example, how high it went, or what the velocity is in that state, which we call state two, then it may be smart to simply compare these two states and to find out how we went from one to two without caring too much about how exactly we went from here to there. Meaning we don't want to integrate all the equations of motion and all our kinematics. We want something simple. And that simple is the work energy balance. What we found is in particular that the kinetic energy of the particle in state two minus the kinetic energy of the particle in state or time t1 is nothing else but w12. And this W12 is nothing else but the total work done on the particle in going from one to two. So forces are acting on the particle and it's moving, they may be performing work, and that is the total work. So physically speaking, all this means is we're losing as much kinetic energy on the way as 
the forces are performing work on the particle. We're not losing energy in a sense, strictly speaking, because the work done is what either contributes to more or less kinetic energy in the system. And then the final thing we discussed was that this W12 can further be split into a conservative part that comes from conservative forces, for example, gravity, springs, even constant forces can be viewed as conservative uh, if they always act in the same direction, and non-conservative forces, friction, drag, these kind of things. And for conservative forces, we saw that they derive from a potential. And in this particular case, this derived, this was nothing else but the potential energy in state one minus the potential energy in state two. So we only have conservative forces like gravity. We don't even need to integrate some work down the particle. We just compare the potential energy. And if there are no non-conservative forces, then that would be it. And this, if you look at it carefully, means nothing else but if we bring the V2 over here and this kinetic energy over here, that means that T plus V is constant. Kinetic plus potential energy remains constant. And that is the case for a conservative system. If the system is not conservative, then we're not fully done yet, but we have to add something. And this is the work done by the non-conservative forces. And by our definition, that's the integral in going from position 1 to position 2. And here we have to integrate all these non-conservative forces. So it will be the sum over all forces which are non-conservative. And those are being integrated along the way. And this is, in a nutshell, everything we need to know about the kinetics of a single particle. If we want to find out how it moves, and we know the forces, we can use linear momentum balance. No longer sum of all forces equals zero, but mass times acceleration. If we know the torques, the momentum being applied to the particle, we can use that. Especially if the distance is constant, then we can use this right away. If the distance is not constant, we can always go back to this equation up here. Right? which is a tiny bit more general, plug this one in and then see what happens. In that case, this guy is not constant, it becomes a bit more complicated. Note that we should always, for this, choose VB to be zero or B to be moving parallel with the particle. And then finally, if you don't want to use any of these two, and especially if you have a problem where you're comparing two states, throwing up a particle, you know, initial velocity, maximum height, or things like that, it's often better to use work energy balance. In fact, in very many exam problems, you can use that one instead. What we do here is we compare two cases, and all we need is the kinetic energy, which is mass times speed squared over 2, the potential energy, which depends on the kind of forces acting, and the work done by any non-conservative forces, if there are any. If there are no non-conservative forces, right, if there's no friction, no drag, nothing funny going on, we can just assume that the total energy, kinetic plus potential, remains constant, and that's what we call the conservation of energy. With this, we're pretty much done. I just want to make one final remark. This may seem very simple because it's only a single particle, but exactly these relations that we see here, they will haunt us for the rest of the semester. Because when we talk about systems of particles, when we talk about rigid bodies, or towards the end, deformable bodies, we will always go back to exactly these three principles, namely linear momentum balance, angular momentum balance, and the work energy balance. They may look a bit different, for you know, large rigid bodies, so for deformable bodies and so forth, but it's going to be always these three principles. So it's best to get used to them now. And that's it for week number two. Thanks very much and have a good one. Ciao.